Greetings and welcome to the introduction to physical science. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about a couple of concepts in physics called momentum and impulse. So what we'll see is that the momentum relates the mass and the velocity of an object and that impulse is a change in the momentum. So we're going to look at those two things in this lecture. So what we find is let's first look at momentum. What is the scientific definition of momentum? Well momentum given by P is equal to the mass of an object multiplied by its velocity. So an object with a large mass will have a higher momentum and an object with a larger velocity will have a higher momentum. Now this is the scientific de definition. Of course momentum is often used in other situations uh, such as sports or even politics where, where someone is said to have the momentum that they are moving that they are going and harder to stop. And that's true because it comes back to inertia. So inertia once in, in a physical sense once things are moving they are more difficult to, st to stop. So something with a higher momentum would be harder to stop than something with a lower momentum. The SI units are kilogram meters per second. So the SI units of this are given by the kilogram multiply the kilogram from the mass. So that comes from mass and the meters per second from the velocity. So let's look at a quick example of this. And what we find is that we're going to try to calculate a momentum. So let's calculate the momentum of a football player at 110 kilograms running at 8 meters per second. So those are the things we know. And let's compare this to the mass to the momentum of a football which is 0.4 kilograms thrown at a much higher rate. So we have two different things we're looking at here. We're looking at different velocities between the two objects where the football itself has a higher velocity. And we're looking at the masses where the football player has a far higher mass than the football itself. So again, we don't really have a sketch here. Let's go ahead and look at what we have and look at our knowns. So we know that the mass of the player is 110 kilograms and their velocity is 8 meters per second. And we have the same information about the ball itself. So we can now calculate what is the momentum of the player. Well, we multiply the mass times the velocity and we multiply the 110 kilograms by the 8 meters per second and get 880 kilogram meter per second. Now we can do the exact same thing with the ball. So the momentum of the ball is given by the mass of the ball multiplied by its velocity and is 10 kilogram meters per second. So we see that there is a great difference. Why is there a difference? Well, there's a difference in velocity of about a factor of three. So there's three times the ball is moving three times faster. However, in terms of the uh, mass, the mass is more than 200 times greater for the play for the player. So when we're, since we're just multiplying things, there's no squaring or anything else involved, the 200 dominates and we're actually going to find a ratio to be able to compare these of if we divide the two 85.85.9 times greater. So the football player has 86 times the momentum of the thrown ball. OK, let's move on and look at a couple of other things. We're going to relate momentum to Newton's second law. So the net force is equal to the change in momentum here divided by the change in time. And remember that momentum is the change in change in the mass times the change in velocity divided by the change in time. So this is really a formulation of Newton's second law. But Newton's second law said F equals MA. Well, this is M times change in velocity divided by change in time. And as I hope you recall, change in velocity divided by change in time here is just the acceleration. So we're really saying that F equals MA. 
Now, the other thing that's useful about this is that this assumes the mass is constant. That's where we get F equals MA. However, it is not the case that mass is always constant. So you could look at this as a change in mass as well. And in fact, the first form up at the top here can be used when the mass is changing. Now, why might the mass be changing? Well, think about a rocket launch. When a rocket launches from the surface of Earth, it has a lot of fuel. And as it rises, it's burning up and expelling that fuel. So its mass is continually decreasing. So that is going to affect this as well with the lower mass it's going to be easier to accelerate. So we can look at that as well. So we tend to assume often that mass here is a constant, but there could be a changing mass as well to consider. So let's look at another example here. And our example is a tennis match uh, where a serve reaches a speed of 58 meters per second and we want to find the force exerted on the tennis ball with a certain mass if they remain in contact for five milliseconds. So we have to do one quick conversion here to start out with. First of all we know the final velocity in meters per second. We know the mass in kilograms those are good. But for the time in milliseconds which are one one thousandth of a second we need to convert that into seconds. So delta T is 0 0.005 seconds. So what we know uh, from what we've learned here is the F the net force is equal to the mass times the change in velocity divided by the change in time. And we know quite a bit of this already. So we know the mass here. We know the velocity of 58 meters per second. And we know the time. So what can we do here? Let's go ahead and look at this. Well, we can go ahead and do the net force um, of 0.57 kilograms that's the mass 0 0.057 kilograms multiplied by the velocity and we can pretty much assume that it started at rest so the change in velocity is just the 58 meters per second this is a serve so the ball was just tossed up and the velocity most of the velocity comes from this from the racket striking it and they were in contact for this very short amount of time five milliseconds and if we calculate that, what we find is that the net force exerted over that time is 660 newtons. So we can calculate the net force there as a rather, rather a significant amount to be able to get that ball moving at a very high speed. All right, the last thing we wanted to look at here in this section is impulse. An impulse is a change in momentum. When the momentum changes, that is what we call an impulse. So delta P is equal to the net force times the change in time. So this is something you're familiar with, maybe not with the terminology, but you're familiar with in everyday life. We do this all the time. The force will be smaller when we make delta T larger. Why? Well, the change in momentum is the same. So if you're bringing something, something moving and you're bringing it to rest, the amount of momentum change is exactly the same because you're going from some momentum to zero momentum. And the longer you take to do that, the better. So a couple of examples here are airbags in a car. What do they do? Well, they slow down and make you move slower. They don't your head does not slam forward. It hits the airbag and slows down. So it takes it a longer time to move. Cars in a collision have a tendency to crumple and damage very easily. And that is to draw out the time of the collision. If cars were very solid, then the impulse would be very large because delta T would be very, very small. Another more uh, common one is if you think about jumping, if you're jumping down off of a step, what do you do? You instinctively bend your legs and you do that to increase the amount of time it takes for the impact.
So you bend your legs and it takes a longer amount of time for you to fully land on the ground. And that decreases the amount of force. If you try jumping and keeping your legs very straight, you can cause damage to your uh, legs because of the very short uh, amount of time that there is to stop. It's a much larger force. So some things that you do every day there or that you may have familiar familiarity with. But anything that we try to extend the amount of time that a collision takes keeps it from uh, keeps things from being damaged as much. All right, let's look at one more example on impulse here. And what we have is a car that is moving at 12 meters per second and crashes into a tree and stops. It stops in 0.28 seconds. We want to calculate the impulse and force of the seat belt that the seat belt exerts on a 78 kilogram passenger to bring them to a halt. So we start, we write what we know, and we know the initial velocity. Remember, we know the final velocity as well. It's zero. We know the mass, and we know the change in time. So we can go ahead and calculate this. And what we'll find is uh, the change in momentum, first of all, is the person going from an initial, their mass does not change, right, 78 kilograms. Um, they went from 12 meters per second to zero. So the change in velocity was 12 meters per second. And we can then find the change in momentum of 940 kilogram meters per second. So that's our change in momentum. The net force that we get is the uh, change in momentum divided by the change in time. So the net force is then the 940 kilogram meters per second divided by 0.28 seconds, which gives us a net force of 3,400 newtons. So 3,400 newtons would be the net force that was exerted. So you can see here some of what we talked about with impulse. If we could make this time larger, increase the time, then the amount of force will become smaller. If we were able to increase this time up to one second, then it would be down to 940 newtons. So significantly reducing the force that will occur uh, when this when this car crash happens. So the longer we can stretch that out, the shorter the time we make, the larger the force. If we were to cut this down to a tenth of a second, it would now be up to 9,000, over 9,000 newtons. So the amount of time that it takes in a crash is what cars are designed to extend as much as they can. And that's why they'll crumple. That's why seat belts and airbags are there to help increase the amount of time and therefore lessen the force on people inside a car. So let's finish up as we do with our summary. And what we talked about was momentum, which is the mass times the velocity. So momentum was given by P, which is equal to the mass times the velocity. And we showed how this is related to Newton's second law of F equals MA. Uh, I demonstrated that earlier on. And impulse we also look at is the change in momentum. So we calculated the impulse in our car crash and then we use that impulse to calculate the force that was involved over that time period of the crash. So that concludes this lecture on momentum and impulse. We'll be back again next time for another topic in physical science. So until then, have a great day everyone and I will see you in class.